Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to Reality Asserts Itself on the analysis.news. I'll be back in a minute with a guest I've been wanting to talk to for years, Jane McAlevey. Jane is one of the leading union organizers in the world. We'll be back in a minute. Doing interviews on the analysis is sometimes frustrating. Analyzing the world, hopefully providing viewers with a deeper understanding about how power is wielded, how class society operates, a historical context for seeing the patterns of the forces that drive our society, how the economy works, why there's systemic racism, the dangers of militarization, climate change, and nuclear war, what effective solutions look like, and what a different kind of society might look like. No doubt, no doubt all this work is valuable, but it's not organizing. And without real on-the-ground organizing in workplaces, schools, and communities, the analysis will remain just interesting talk. I've always hoped what I do at the analysis will support the work of organizers in the field. And that's why I'm very excited about this series with Jane McAlevey. She's the organizer's organizer. In fact, in a series of sessions called Organizing for Power, which is a free online training and networking program for organizers worldwide, Jane has attracted more than 10,000 workers from six continents and 70 countries in the past 18 months. And that's the tip of the iceberg when you understand the organizing and training Jane has carried out for decades. Jane McAlevey is currently a senior policy fellow at the University of California and Berkeley's Labor Center, part of the Institute of Labor and Employment Relations. Her third book, A Collective Bargain, Unions Organizing and Fight for Democracy, argues that despite, if not because of, the withering attacks on working people from the U.S. Supreme Court, conservative state and local governments, and the corporate class, the survival of American democracy depends on rebuilding unions. Her first book, Raising Expectations, and in brackets, Raising Hell, was named the most valuable book of 2012 by The Nation magazine. Her second book was No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in the New Gilded Age, which was released in 2016. From 2010 to 2015, she earned a PhD, followed by a two-year postdoc at Harvard, at Harvard University Law School. She's a regular commentator on radio and TV. As viewers who know my work know, Reality Asserts Itself is a series I do that starts with a more biographical take. That is, why my guests think what they think and what, what helped form their worldview and identity. Then we get into more current issues, and in this case, perhaps the most urgent and important issues facing humanity, organizing workers to change the world. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Jane McAlevey. It's great to be here, Paul. Thank you so much. So you're not just about organizing, you're about winning, but not just winning in a conventional sense. You're winning in terms of advancing the power of working people. Your whole life has been about learning the lessons of how to accomplish this. So let's start at your beginning. What kind of political culture was in your house? What were the influences that, that set you on this road? And, and eventually we'll, we'll try to find out why the hell do you think you can win? I really love the opening question uh, and that you've gone straight to one of my favorite topics, which is winning. Um, I think there's far too little attention to the actual concept of winning, why it matters and how we do it, which is pretty much my life obsession, uh, making sure people know how to do that. So, I, you know, I, I, had a, I had an upbringing that was both tragic in some ways, because I lost my mother as a toddler, um, and then amazing in other ways, because it meant that my political mentorship started at about age three. My father was a politician by the time I was born, meaning an elected politician in New York. Um, and he had already held quite a few offices by the time I came along as the youngest of a large family. And I'd say right from the get-go, first off, I was his campaign prop. I mean, the best way I can describe it is I was the proverbial little girl that he would shove into a grocery you know, uh, cart at, out in front of the grocery stores and let me hand out literature for him. And who wouldn't stop to talk to the little girl standing in a grocery, probably illegal these days to put a kid in a you know, grocery cart like that. Um, 
I was on bumper stickers. Uh, I went to rallies with him. I was always on picket lines with him because he was put into office one election after another by a much stronger trade union movement. Um, he was considered, you know, the candidate uh, of sort of every trade union in my childhood. Um, and where, where was this? New York, just outside of New York City. We were born, he was born and raised in the city. My uncle, Danny McFarish, was actually the head of the Brooklyn Building Trades at the height of the, what we think of as the height of the trade union movement in the 30s and 40s. So, you know, a lot of trade union history and the building and construction trades, sort of Irish Scottish, you know, kind of lineage um, on my father's side. Um, they all came down through. And before he was a politician, what did he do? Before he was a politician, um, you know, and this was definitely a really, this has sharpened my analysis as I got older, the more we would talk about it. I mean, he went essentially from being a kid who thought he would be, you know, follow his father's footsteps into the Boilermakers Union, um, which had gotten his family through the Great Depression. And then World War II broke out. My father was the kind of person who lied uh, to get in to the Air Force. He was 17, but he wanted to go fight the Nazis. Um, and he became a fighter pilot. And he became <laughs> uh, the wingman to the ace of the German theater for the US Air Force. So he was a very seriously decorated World War II fighter pilot. Um, you know, it's interesting. My father did the same thing. I think when he was 18, he joined the Canadian Air Force and wound up in Bomber, com com bomber Command. Wow. See that? I mean, it's it's to me to me, all of this really does have huge influence on how I think about the topic of winning for sake of argument. I mean, I can remember my father saying to me, uh, you know, his job was literally to defend the ace. Right. His job was to take a bullet if they were going to if the whatever those planes were called, they had way better planes than we did before the P-52, before the Mustang came along in the U.S. side. Um, so he lived through like when the airplanes were really bad and then when they got much better airplanes. Um, I think it was the Messerschmitts. I forget what they were called that they were fighting. But anyway, you know, he, I remember him saying to me and Wetmore was the ace of the U.S. Air Force in the German theater. So my father used to say, if you mess up your power analysis and your strategy, the guys are not going to come home with you. They're going to die. So I feel like as a little girl, like I to me, it was like, wait, if you mess up your strategy, people are going to die. I took that really seriously. Um, and then when he was parking me, you know, when you have a dead mother and you get there's a lot of kids and you and I'm pre preschool, right? I'm a little teeny girl. I'm a toddler. I'm not in school yet. So he literally took me everywhere. And I was either being raised by the public sector trade union secretaries. You know, let's be fair that he would just hand them off to, you know, hand me to them or he'd park me in the Carpenters Union Hall. Uh, from whence he came. And that local was a very radical carpenter, you know, very good carpenters union, you know, good on immigration, good on race, good on a lot of issues back in the day. And he would just leave me there um, to like, as like his form of daycare. And so I used to literally think that I had hundreds of brothers because it was like, I was surrounded by the brotherhood of carpenters. Um, you know, and I was the daughter of a politician that they loved. So I also learned in the carpenters hall, um, you know, that if you didn't win, there were consequences. If you didn't win, whether it was if you didn't win a strike, if you didn't win a good contract, or in their case, if my father's election campaigns didn't win, then a lot of the project labor agreements, a lot of the, the, the pro-union stances that were breaking out in a high construction building boom in the New York City suburbs, you know, we're going to go the wrong way. So to be honest, I think that I learned a tremendous amount in my young 20s, I had this sort of rebellion, and I think I did not quite appreciate just how intensely I learned at such young ages, not just that winning mattered, but that strategy mattered, that understanding your opponent mattered, that being able to outthink your opponent mattered, and that there were methods and disciplines that you could learn that would help our side win. That comes straight from like age three on. Uh, and I, I now I have a great appreciation for all the things I learned from my father uh, when I was much younger. Now, what years are we talking about when you're a toddler? So she starts getting basically sick, 68, three years old, 68, 69, um, 70, straight through 
his last campaign, I mean, basically he eventually stepped out of the campaigns because, you know, he had a dead wife and a lot of kids who were in a lot of trouble. Uh, so for me, it was all- But your, form your formative years are the 60s into the 70s. No, well, no, I'm three years old then. I mean, so I don't, I don't know. My, my formative years are probably not till I lead a high school walkout um, and I'm suspended for that uh, over grotesque gym requirements that were dehumanizing to girls. Okay, we're going. Let's get into that in a second because that's a big part of the story. Uh, just a little bit more about your father. Yeah. D d what political tradition stream is, does he? Is he out of the a socialist tradition or kind of a more liberal labor tradition? Or? Yeah, not um, not easily pegged, which I feel like is also something I carry from him. I mean, I would say that his values, his values, we just lost him a few months ago. So I'm now extrapolating what he would, how he would answer the question, but died at 90, just shy of 98. Um, I think wow. that his, I, I think his values were very socialist in nature. He was influenced when he came home from the war, he became a pacifist. He was overwhelmed by the war. I should also say, he didn't come home that quickly. There were there were very few years between what he did in the war and then running for office. Very few, because he got he got kept on for the Marshall Plan. So they asked him. To, they put him in charge of rebuilding the railroads that we had blown up. So he was literally in charge of helping to rebuild the German rail system, which then set him up years later. He was a commissioner for decades on the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the MTA, that governs all of public transportation in New York City. That's a gubernatorial appointment. He did that through multiple generations because of his experience rebuilding the German rail lines. So, um, but his influence was the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker Movement, which is an interesting one to try and pin politically. So that's, so he comes home from the war. He's completely overwhelmed. He's lost most of the guys, right? Very few fighter pilots came home. He's overwhelmed. Um, in retro, you know, PTSD and just trying to figure out what just happened. Very proud because they've defeated the Nazis, but he saw a lot of death as, as your father, I'm sure did too. And many of them did. And many of the people going to Kandahar did, and it's, it's continues, right? The kind of, that kind of trauma. So he becomes a pacifist. He gets, he gets caught up with Dorothy Day's work in New York city, almost like a vow of anti-poverty um, or a vow of poverty um, to fight poverty. Uh, and he and my mother were both very influenced. She was a she was also in the war. She was a woman who joined the Women's Auxiliary, so she was also um, a vet um, in the United States, considered a veteran herself from the United States uh, military. And um, I think I think I mean he's very much like the way I would describe Bernie Sanders or a Jeremy Corbyn. Um, maybe Jeremy Corbyn's a little more explicitly socialist because it's safer, you know, in Europe than in the United States. Um, but I think his politics could easily be described as Bernie Sanders like today, um, which meant he thought that there was only a two part. You know, he sort of accepted we have a two party system. I'm going to run to the left um, of the Democratic Party. That was his philosophy. I'm going to take out the corporate Democrats and put in Democrats who believe in working people and trade unions. I mean, if someone said something bad about either black people or trade unions in my house as a little girl, it's the only time he would ever raise a hand to anyone. And that included any one of my brother's friends who were in the house. I mean, if you crossed a racial line or you crossed like something that was overtly classist or against a trade union, uh, you would never come back in the house. So, um, and he would arm at election time. This is a fun, a real story that's actually quite fun. We were sharing, swapping stories because of his death recently. Um, he would, in the old days, they would have car caravans, right? This is the 60s and 70s. The Republican Party would still drive around in car caravans that had like, you know, bullhorns on the top of them. And they would go up and down the streets and, you know, propagandize in election time. And my father would famously, all the time, gather up, every neighborhood kid there was, he would guarantee that if they came to our house when the Republican car caravans were coming, everyone would get one or two dozen sets of eggs because we had a big wall <laughs> and they would, they would climb over the wall. And the goal was, could you get it into the, the thing that projected the voices out above their cars? If you could get it, he would call it a hole in the wall. If you could get the egg yolk in there, it would actually ruin their ability to project. You know, I mean, this was his approach to politics was like, you're going to come down our street. Oh, no, you're not. You know what I mean? So um, 
Uh, he was the left of the Democratic Party, and he ran to the left of the Democratic Party his whole life. So as, as you're becoming more politically conscious, are we into Reagan? Yeah. I mean, I'm not even I'm not even voting age, though, in the first round of Reagan. It's not until the second. I don't come a voting age legally until the second Reagan term. But now, Re when Reagan does win, he wins in a landslide. Uh, the media is absolutely in love with the guy. They won't lay a glove on him. The prevailing culture is a really renewed Cold War rhetoric against the Soviet Union and the, you know, the ascendancy of the right. So uh, how is this affecting young Jane, whose father is clearly on the other side of this equation? Uh, do, do you feel like, uh, like a, a lot of the identity of Americans is Americanism? Yeah. How does that affect your Americanism? Well, I think I grew up in a very internationalist household because my mother was Swedish. So I always had an influence of like, there was this better country where things were done better than in the United <laughs> States, where people were treated more fairly. Um, so I think that Sweden always loomed in the back of my, um, in the back of my orientation. And I knew from being a little girl going over to Sweden to meet relatives, of which I have many, and I'm frequently in Sweden still, I knew from visits when I was young that there was this other way to be a country that seemed a lot more fair to me, um, that you didn't have to pay for your health care, that you didn't have to pay for college, that you didn't have to do all these things. So I think that I had the internationalist inclination in part because of coming from a household with a, you know, where I was sort of first generation influence on this side. Um, but I also think there was no question that the concept of Ronald Reagan was just a, com you know, complete, there, that was like the, the biggest offense, you know, on planet Earth to my father would be Reagan's election for sake of argument. So I was out of the house then. I left my house quite young at 15. My father married many times, um, trying to find someone who would take in all these kids. You know what I mean? So I didn't get along with the one that came along a little bit later, even though she was the leader of the teachers union, because who else would marry a left wing politician, right? The head of the teachers union. So um, she had good politics, but we didn't get along very well. And I found myself out of my house at 15. So um, and I got out of left high school, did all. You where, know, where, where'd you go at 15? Where'd you go live? I moved uh, in with one of my big sisters into a black women's lesbian collective in Harlem. She was the only white person in it. They adopted me. Until you got there. They were, they adopted me. Um, I was like their project, I think. And I thank all of them too. One of them is still alive and she's an amazing, she, I don't really, same thing. I don't, the, like the, the places I wound up put me in a position to be mentored by people who absolutely shaped me. So being around a bunch of black lesbian women who were reading our bodies ourselves when I was 15 was sort of this just like uh, shocking things would go on in the house that were so good for me to experience. Um, and you're living in before gentrified Harlem. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and it was an amazing experience actually to live there. And then I went off to State University. Um, I figured out a way, I'd skipped out of the, anyway, it's sort of complicated how I found, how I talked my way with a, what we call advanced placement credits and such. Well, hold on, hold on. Don't jump over high school here. Okay. Oh, there's yeah. a point, there's a point at which all these experiences, all this, these things that shaped who you are. And there's a point where you say, hell no, I'm not taking this. I'm going to start organizing, which kind of sets the tone for your whole life. So tell us the story. When, when does this become a decision for you? Um, it, I am 14. I am, it's actually interesting for how I think about organic leadership, which I write about in my PhD dissertation many years later. I realized in retrospect, I was an organic leader in the high school fight. I'm in high school. Um, I'm a jock. I'm on the cross country team. I'm a runner. I'm on the track team. We have to threaten a Title IX, which had just been passed in 73, right? So in 1973, there were amendments in the United States that said girls had the right to play sports. So um, they wouldn't let me do the hurdles. I don't know if everyone knows what the hurdles are, you know, but you run and jump and run and jump and run and jump. Um, 
and they would not let me hurdle because girls were not allowed to hurdle. They didn't think that girls could run fast and jump a series of fences the way men could or boys could. So my father threatened a Title IX lawsuit. You know, that didn't take long for them to figure out they didn't want to mess with him, right? He'd been this famous politician in the county. So he wrote a very strong letter to my high school saying, um, which I'd, sk he, I'd skipped grades when I was younger, so I'm in high school young. And so I think I'm 14 and he writes a letter and says, you know, you will let her hurdle or there's gonna be a legal fight here. Uh, so I become the first girl who's running the hurdles and I have to train with the boys team because the girls aren't allowed to hurdle. So their compromise is, okay, you can train with the boys. Fast forward. So a bit, you know, I'm, I'm winning, I'm setting some records, whatever, um, in high school sports. And in gym, in regular gym class, they announce that there's gonna be new gym uniforms that all girls and boys will have to wear, but the ones that girls are gonna to have to wear, let me just say, were grotesque. They were essentially like turning girls into little playthings. I don't know, for the coaches or the height, they were grotesque. They were like V-neck, tight, super short shorts. And if you were anything but like a perfect bodied young girl, you were gonna be horrified. I mean, you were not gonna come out of the locker room. I mean, it was, it's hard to describe that this was like my first real campaign, except um, I was watching all these young, yeah, I guess girls, we were girls, we were teenagers. You know, sensitive teenagers are. I'm watching the devastation, a lot of black girls in my school, nice integrated school who are particularly outraged about what they're what the uniform they're being asked to wear. So we start a petition. This is ridiculous. And it helps, which is my analogy many years later to who organic leaders are. It helps that I'm like a star of the track team, right? I'm going to take this on as the star of the track team. I'm not going to let some, let's just say, someone whose body is not good in the uniform, like I can wear the uniform because I'm a jock. So I take it on and say, this is totally oppressive, sexist, misogynist, get these uniforms out of here. We're allowed to wear baggy anything we want. We can put on our sweatpants. We can put on a big t-shirt and go to gym. Um, we're not gonna be turned into sex objects at age 14 um, in public high school. Um, so we let a walk out, led to a walkout, a mass walkout. We shut down a 2000 person um, high school. They reversed the policy, you know. Okay, um, hang on. So so how did you organize that? Like, like practically what did you do to get 2000 people to walk out of a high school because unless there's some tradition of walking out of the high school i i expect it's not so easy to do you know i don't even remember the details except uh i remember the press clips uh because i'm sure my father was very proud of them <laughs> but um we started with a petition which would be something i've been doing my whole life just to make sure that like i think he was coaching me like make sure that everyone really agrees with you first like you don't don't just walk out, you know, you gotta make sure people really agree. Um, and it, it didn't take long. We started a petition. Well, this is like what you look, this, your, your point later, don't try to org, uh, send in for certification for a union until you got 75% of the cards. Hello, centers. I mean. So this begins, this begins here. Very young, <laughs> right? But that's what I mean about his training. Like he said to me, well, you're gonna walk out. Who cares if you walk out? Everyone has to walk out, this is my father. Everyone has to walk out. Can't just be you walking out. And I was like, oh, that's a good point. You know, so I think I just went off and began to organize. Um, and we had a very successful walkout and reversed, you know, draconian sexist uh, uniforms, which. So you won. Yeah, we won. I mean, and, and we won. And I remember getting lots of the girls on the on the track team. And, you know, I, I went to athletes, right? That my conception of who needed to lead were the people who were the athletes, not the people who didn't have good nutrition at home, uh, came from home, you know, have reasons why their bodies didn't look the same as the young athletes, right? So I understood the fight had to be waged and led. The administration had to see their star, you know, high school track players and baseball players and volleyball players leading the charge against these ridiculously sexist uh, uniforms. So. That, that that would be a good, you know, and then I go on to college and of course become student body president very quickly of a 28,000 person university. Um, and I'm the first left-wing candidate. Hey, hang on, okay. hang on. That's, okay. that's a big jump here. Okay, not that you, big. You can't but... just become student body president of 28,000 students very quickly. I mean, how do you get, I mean, nobody even knows who you are. How do you get to be the president so fast? 
What does very quickly mean? Second year, the first year I got to the first year I got to State University, and I was totally broke at that point. I was waiting tables. I had moved out. It was a little contentious. I didn't have a dime to my name except whatever I was making. Um, so I learned to wait tables in New York diners. Boy, that's a way to cut your teeth in waiting tables. But anyway, um, I was waiting tables and supporting myself, you know, starting at 15. And with the help of the collective I was living in and my big sister. Um, and I applied to the state universities just because I knew I didn't have money to go anywhere else. And they were cheap. At that time, they were still quite affordable. So I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo, puts me pretty close to Toronto. Of course, that we saw Toronto as a place to drive over the border and go get really high quality beer, but I digress. Anyway, I, I trot off to Buffalo to the State University. And the, within a week of getting there, this is an interesting, interesting line to straight point to today. The original Governor Cuomo, Mario Cuomo, has just been elected. Now he's a Democrat. Now it's important to know that he helped take my father out of office in the last primary he ran. So I already don't like this man. Like, I don't care that he's a Democrat. He's a centrist Democrat, in my opinion. My father and he had very bad blood um, from the last primary fight that my father was in. Um, Cuomo was going after someone much more centrist. So I, so, so Cuomo was elected in 1980, I think on the Reagan ticket, if I have my dates right in New York. Again, I don't, I can't vote in 1980. It takes another couple of years before I, um, turn 18 and I can vote. But so, um, so Cuomo is governor. And the, one of the first things that Cuomo does, Mario Cuomo, smarter than Andrew by a long shot. But anyway, politics were challenging. Um, the first thing that Mario Cuomo does is he announces that he's going to put through the biggest tuition increase in the history of the public university system in New York state. And I'm like broke. I'm a working class kid, you know, trying to figure out how to pay for school on my own. Um, and suddenly the prospect of me having to drop out of school or work a lot more hours becomes very real. And I'm, I'm like, oh, this is the Democrat? Well, we don't realize this is the beginning of, you know, who the Democrats become in the United States, right? This is the Reagan era. This is the end of big government. I mean, Clinton will officially say it later. Um, but Cuomo begins an austerity program in New York. And the first people he goes after are like working class kids in the state university. And so I immediately, you know, look to see who was doing what. A flyer went up, you know, come to the protest about the, the proposed tripling of State University of New York tuition. And I go to the protest, which I think is badly organized, by the way, but I go and it's small and there's not that many people there. And I'm like, okay, this is not going to work. You know what I mean? Like a small little protest on campus is not going to work. And I learned at the protest that our statewide student unions, there was a statewide student union of the 64 college campuses. I would later go on to become the head of that, but we have a statewide student union for the 64 public universities um, in New York state. It's the second largest public, public university system in the United States. So now I'm at, but I'm at SUNY Buffalo, I'm at the, at the university. And I say, okay, well, of course I'm gonna ride the bus to Albany to the state capitol to go to the protest at the state capitol. And I get on the bus, we have one bus from our university. We do the five hour drive to the state capitol. And I think I'm 17. Maybe I'm 18 by then, 17 or 18. And I get on the bus and I go, and actually the protest at the Capitol is quite good. And now I feel a little bit badly because schools that have far less students, SUNY, SUNY was 28,000 people, right? It's a big university. Schools that had far less students were showing up with three and four and five buses. And I'm thinking to myself, now why would a school with less students have four buses and my university only had one bus? this is not good. You know, I'm just doing some analysis when we got to stop this tuition increase because it's serious and it's personal and I can't afford to go to school. So um, they recruit, I started asking questions at the statewide rally and it's four or 5,000 students. It's a good showing. We do a lobby day. You know, we go lobby the legislature, whatever we do, we do this big protest and it's organized by the statewide student union of all the public university students. And they will tell you, they, we're all over the, all the leaders are all over the trade union movement today. I mean, we, we've all get, gone into leadership positions in different ways. So it was a great training ground to have a state student union. Um, and the, at my elders there would say that like that very first day, they were like, get her. Um, and they grabbed me and said, you know, we need a representative on your campus because it's a pretty weak campus for the state student union. 
uh, would you run to become a delegate of the state student union? So just like a union structure, like a campus steward, shop steward, they said, we don't have a delegate on your campus, which is part of why your turnout is so bad. Would you become a delegate for the state student union? And I said, I don't know what that means, but if you're serious about stopping the tuition increase, so am I. So sure, I'll do whatever it is. And that was the beginning. So I first got elected, and then I had to stand for office. So I got elected state student union delegate my first year on campus. That was easy. We stopped the tuition increase. The next time we sent buses, we sent like nine buses. Um, we defeated him in the tuition increase proposal, his first one. This became a war every year. Him being Cuomo. Cool, and then... The next, and then the very next year, I thought our student government was awful. I mean, it was like this, like pre-law school fraternity. So hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Nine buses. So at some point, you must have had to have stood up in front of a bunch of students and spoken, given no, a speech. No, no, I organized. No, I no, I started to organize. I wanted one representative per per dormitory. Then I wanted one representative for the off-campus students. Then I wanted block captains for the off-campus students, and I wanted floor captains in the dormitories. And I began to build an entire organizing infrastructure because I understood from my father's campaigns, ain't no one doing this alone. So we Well, built this is one of the big lessons of McAlevey, which is you build structure. You build structure. So we literally went into the dorms and built serious structure because the dorms were the easiest place first. We had a lot of students living in the dormitories, undergraduates. Graduates were mostly off campus. The undergraduates were mostly on campus. Um, so we built a dormitory by dormitory structure. And that structure that we used to defeat the tuition increase and turn out for the buses one year later would become my electoral platform campaign committee. Um, and when I decided to run for student body president against conservative white guys, honestly, like pre-law post students, like they were just wasting money in the student government, in my opinion, and doing absolutely nothing. So I was indignant about this. Um, like they, they, we had to like beg them, I remember, to get money to send. Like we kept getting more and more buses. We kept filling more and more buses. And we were like begging these pre-law school students to like give us more money to fund the buses to protest the tuition increase. And I thought, okay, these guys got to get out of here. You know what I mean? So we built the structure around the fight to stop the tuition increase. And then a year later, I thought my father again said to me, you don't run alone because you don't want to take office alone. You want governing power. So you want to put a slate together. This is literally all this. This this stuff is wildly untold. This part of my history. So now I'm, I think, 18 and I know we've got a base in the dormitories and no one sees it coming because none of those pre-law school students or the, the jocks and the athletes and the pre-law school guys who ran the student government. They weren't paying any attention to this, they didn't care. So when we filed, we put a party together and I'm embarrassed, but you know, okay, I'm 18, so give me a break or 17, I don't forget. I think I was 17, I think I wasn't drinking age yet. Yeah, because they would make fun of me because I was too young to drink, so um, legally. So I put together a party called the Spark Party, S-P-A-R-K, and my sister who was an artist who I was living with in the Harlem Collective made, made literature for us, so it looked we had like literature and she said, you want to unfold the literature. So I remember the day we bombed the campuses, all of them in every dorm. And the first thing we did was we, when people went to sleep, we wanted it to shock people in the morning all over the big university. There were, there were the first flyers that we put up said nothing but spark. And they had like a party logo and it was just spark, like a, um, a spark, like a stick of dynamite. And they were all over campus. And right away, the student newspaper was like, what the hell are these posters all over campus? So we were just getting people to wonder what was Spark. And it was everywhere. So I put together a slate for every single office and the entire student senate. We ran 37 people, I think, in total. Seven, you know, president, vice president, vice president for student affairs, whatever all those little titles are. All right, so this is, I mean, this is not a small thing. You just said it in like, like it's nothing. You had talked to way more than 37 people to get 37 people to run. Oh yeah, and they all came from the fight to stop tuition. So, you know, this is my life lesson. We, you build a fight around an issue, you win the issue, and then you seize power. But the lesson from my father that was very important to me was, you must win governing power. You don't want to become president of the student body and then fight all these dimwit pre-law school people who are going to battle with you. He's like, you want to knock them all out, every one of them. So we literally swept 
every single seat in student government, the entire, every single position. So I walked in and the entire student government turned over to a bunch of young left-wing radicals who had stopped the tuition increase. Um, and we began like our speaker, we had $10 million of money with a $10 million budget called the, what? Stu the student fee a budget. student budget of $10 million? Student fee money, right? That's what dues are. And in under New York law, you had to campaign every three years to have the student fees approved. And straight away when we won, guess what happened? The Yaffers, the Young Americans for Freedom, which still exists, the Reagan, the, the Reagan kids came after me. So they were like, because we started, we, we read to the Speakers Bureau. We began to bring Sandinista soldiers to speak and pay them 5,000 to show up. We began to bring in, you know, people who were against the Star Wars Reagan that Reagan was advancing. And we would, you know, write them checks for 50,000 to give a speech on Star Wars, which was our way of you know, <laughs> funneling legitimately. Well, at, some point, at some point, the FBI must have shown up. Well, that was later. Yeah, we, we fought. That was when I became State Student Union President, which would be the next year. So... Um, we stopped uh, Star Wars, Reagan's Star Wars program from coming to our university because they, they offered a ton of money to do the right wing research on campus. So we were immediately in this pitch battle with the Young Americans for Freedom who campaigned to defeat, it's like the student taxes, to defeat the student fee because it was coming up for vote in the year I was student body president. And I'm like, wow, we got $10 million to spend in the student government. Who knew? So more than most union locals I was in when I was young. So um, all of, you know, this was all, this was all great. This is all like long before 20, you know? So then we had to defeat the Young Americans for Freedom. So that was literally my team who believed in taxes and student taxes going up against the Young American for Freedom boys who were the Reagan Young Republicans on campus straight at us. And we defeated them like four to one in the approval of the student fee. That would then go on for like another four, like every four years you had to run a sort of like a dues increase, but you had to run the student fee to keep it legal under New York law. Um, anyway, so that's campus. Now, when, when, when Jane at that point is talking to Jane, are, are you at ever some point freaked out by all of this? I mean, you're, you're no part way. of a leadership of this. And this was, I assume this fight with the Reaganites would get rather bitter. And I'm sure they called you all kinds of names and oh, yeah. threatened. Oh, yeah. And did that never cause you to question what you were doing? Never. No. And I think that's where the fighter pilot gene comes in. I really do. I mean, I feel like my father, you know, gave me a fighter pilot gene somehow um, because they would just piss me off. I mean, if they came at me, I would just be like, oh, you know, in my father's campaigns, they were very intense campaigns. Like we had, he would, my, go backwards for a minute. He built the first public housing in the New York suburbs, which may not mean, which may not translate depending on the audience listening to this, but that meant bringing black people into the white suburbs. That's what it was translated as. And it was a holy jihad war against him by the racist in the county in which, you know, outside of New York City. Um, so like we like I had a um, police escort at one point. We had a cross burned on the lawn. Like I had already experienced when you stick your neck out for something like racial justice as if my father just watching my father fight around racial justice and keeping the building trade unions with him. Right. Which was crucial to him winning was like he understood he understood the formula was that you had to hold your base if you were going to head into really controversial work. So he said to the building trades unions, you guys, the racists are coming. I'm going to guarantee you a great project labor agreement. There's going to be the highest paid union jobs in town. Everyone's going to get top scale in the union and you're going to defend my right to build public housing. And it worked. So he had all of the trade unions fight white building trades guys, Scottish, Irish, whatever, fighting the white racist because they wanted the really good jobs to build all the public housing. So these are like lessons from my childhood. So um, so these Young Americans for Freedom guys you know, would come straight at me and I, uh, you know, I just didn't give a rat's ass what they said to me because we were we, when we beat them i was like try again like try again you know what i mean they were no we had, we had a huge well-organized student movement 
that was winning everything. And that would then set me up to everyone saying, okay, well, you're going to run for state student union president next. Um, and that I didn't plan to Because do. You're, you're not just fighting the right. You also took on the corporate Democrats. That's right. And you won. Yeah. And, and as state student union president, it would get even crazier because then I was the statewide, you know, 260,000 students in the public university system. Now I'm the leader of 260,000 students in the state. What of year are we in now? The year I become state student union president, I think is 83. I think. Um, right. So well, sort of three years into Reagan. Yeah. 83 to 84. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone is and, and everyone is saying, you know, oh, students are all ap apathetic and pro Reagan, which was making me, as you might imagine, like my 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 blood would curl when I would hear that from other, from like anti-Vietnam War era protesters would be like, oh, the, the next generation's a lost cause. Meanwhile, I'm like, really? We stopped Star Wars research on our campus. We defeated a corporate Democrat trying to do an austerity. I didn't know the word austerity then, but, you know, we stopped a tuition increase. Um, oh, my God, we stopped a move to Division One football. We, we'd, we had like won so many things in one year on campus. So then people said, you know, you need to you need to run for state student union president. So I did. And you have to compete on all the campuses then. Right. So. Um, so I became the elected leader of the state student union, which put me in, which meant that I also became the official student trustee on the official board of trustees that governs the public university system, right? In a generation before me, the students had won the right to one representative on the board of trustees. Who, who else is a trustee? Are these people from business and whatever? Totally. Um, you know, it's a, the, everyone else is appointed by the governor. So now you can imagine we've we've been battling the governor. So now I'm sitting on a board and they can't get rid of me because I'm an elected position. And the rest of them are governor, you know, gubernatorial appointees from Governor Mario Cuomo. So I'll give you one example because it's all, you know, everything, everything that's um, new is old or old is new or something. The new secretary of state of the United States, uh, Andrew Blinken is the son of Donald Blinken, who was a massive Wall Street investor. And I've been talking serious right wing Wall Street guy. He was the chair of the board of trustees when I was a student trustee. And the first campaign that I would lead against the father of the current secretary of the United States is I walked in and what was what was happening in 1984 um, and 1983, the, the beginning of the movement to divest our funds from South Africa. So I say, Okay, I'm the student trustee now. Give me the investment portfolio. Let me see it. And I have all rights as a trustee, right? I'm a legal appointed trustee on the governing body of the lar second largest public university system in America. So I request our investment portfolio. So Donald Blinken, father of current, sec you know, Biden secretary of state. Um, I keep wanting to send a note saying, oh, I fought your father badly. Anyway, so his <laughs> father, the, the fa Donald Blinken, huge investment banker, super conservative. I mean, you couldn't hate me more than this guy hated me by the end of that first year. Um, the student body, the state student union president the year before me introduced the divestment resolution. She and I are still, are still good friends, by the way. So she was only the second female president of the state student union. I was the third in the history of whatever, 40 years of state student union president. So she had introduced it. Her name was Susan Ray. She introduced the divestment resolution uh, the year before, and a bunch of us, you know, like thousands of us were protesting, and we were pretty resoundingly defeated. So I got elected president, and then my very first meeting at the State University Board of Trustees after our summer convention, the statewide student convention, I say to everyone, should I do it at the very first meeting? And people are like, first meeting, McAlevey, first meeting of the school year, you got to reintroduce the divestment resolution. Who because says this to you? Oh, the, but, you know, my, my whatever, the, the people I was representing, right, my delegates. Um, so I have a binding resolution from the state convention of the state student union, you know, which is probably 800 um, statewide student leaders. And we say, let's go for it at the first meeting of the school year. So we got to pack it. We got to have thousands of people in the Capitol, um, which is where the headquarters of the State University of New York are right down the hill from the state Capitol. And so it's my first meeting as a student, as the student trustee. So we get to the meeting um, and I've of course had tried to propose it properly, but Blinken rejected me and you can bring this something up in a new business if you want. Okay, fine. 
Um, so I bring it up and for procedural reasons, they get to delay me for like another meeting. So then we have to pack the state capital again. You know, we're learning how the rules work. So for the next meeting, I say, OK, now it's actually going to come up for a vote because we've gotten through some procedural hurdle. And I knew that we were not going to win the vote because I'd been trying to be the young girl, you know, trying to win over the board of trustees. I'll tell you who one of them was, interestingly, though, at one one sort of supporter, although she believed in the Sullivan principles, but um, Bill Moyer's wife, Judith Moyers, was like the liberal on the board. So Judith, and I didn't, I didn't know who Bill Moyers was back then. You know, I mean, I'm young. So um, Judith Moyers was a liberal on the board um, and she, she would make it so I could speak. She would say, now, I'm sorry, chair, chairman, you have to let her speak. She has the right to speak. She's a trustee. Anyway, so Judith Moyers would play a role of making it so at least I had my right to raise my hand and speak. Um, so we made the, we introduced the resolution. I think we picked up maybe one or two votes, but it went down badly. We had planned already in a serious planning session that if we didn't win the vote to divest all of the state university's funds from apartheid South Africa, we were going to occupy the building. Mm. I wore under my, I wore a very strategic outfit. So I'll create, this was all documented. This is where the FBI comes in, by the way. So when you were asking, so I had worn uh, to the meeting, a, a sort of tent dress on purpose. And I was, I had chain links. Uh, I had chain wrapped around my body and padlocks and the plan. I hope there's was, pictures of this. The plan was there, there are definitely the, the news coverage begins then. So Associated Press, well, cause I've got, I wind up going to jail. So this is what happens. So they send me to jail, which is a big overreach. And then we kill them in the next vote when I get out of jail. So I'm wearing chain link, you know, not chain link. I'm wearing like thick chain around my body. I know we're going to lose the vote. I've got a padlock that we've determined can't easily be clipped. There's a whole research team recon of students doing the activist part for me. Um, but I've got a security clearance pass, right? Because I'm a legal trustee. So the plan is if the vote goes down, I'm going to make it look like I'm going to the bathroom. I'm going to get up and excuse myself because there's only like a certain number of students allowed in the, in the room and the rest are downstairs, this multi thousand chanting, screaming outside the headquarters. And we had scoped the whole thing out and we knew only I could do it because I had a, I could swipe, like I could get through all the doors. So I left the room, left everything sitting on the table, made it look like I was coming back. You know, I'm just going to take a bathroom break and clear my head. Went down the elevator, went straight to the business office where all the investment portfolios were held. This is all pre-scoped. Opened the door and said, because I didn't want to freak out all the women, right, workers, union, good union workers, opened the doors. Uh, and I had like 10 with me um, who had gone downstairs as well, the 10 who were allowed up. Um, this is so intense. This is like first serious direct action. And I say to everybody very quickly, and all, mostly women secretaries, right? Staffing this huge office of a state university. And we say to them very quickly, we'd love for you to leave. We're about to padlock the doors. So either you can leave. We don't want to hurt anybody in this room at all, but we're going to padlock the doors in, in about a minute. So either get up and leave, or you're going to be padlocked in with us. And every one of them just got up and left. Uh, filed out, and then we padlocked the doors closed. We opened the windows. There were students outside with ladders. This was all scoping and planning. There were students outside with ladders, and they began to pour in. Now, the police were already on, were on the scene pretty quickly, but I think probably about 120 of us got in through the windows that I had opened um, before the cops were pulling the ladders down and pulling students off the ladders. So now we were in a full occupation. The doors were sealed and padlocked together. The cops were staffing the windows outside. We were one story up, so it wasn't a big climb, but you had to be willing to climb up. Um, and the occupation was beginning. We, we had a communications team because the State Student Union had full-time staff. So the, the press was there taking our storyline right away. What's going on? There's a building occupation. Police are swarming the State University headquarters. Um, and it's like a 12-hour standoff. Um, and they're demanding that we come out and we're like, you divest the universe, go reverse your vote, go upstairs and reverse the vote, tell the trustees to reverse the vote and we will leave peacefully. No problem. 
But the meantime, we were photographing everything in the investment portfolio files. So two of the people who came with me were like smart graduate researchers who were pouring through the investment documents and photocopying them. This goes to the jail and all the other things later. Anyway, so we're pouring through documents that are in the file cabinets in the investment head of the State University headquarters. About 12. How many students, how many students are out outside supporting you? The, you know, by the evening when they finally drag us out, there's probably a couple thousand. And this is all in AP coverage. There, there is, you know, it's pre-Google, but there's plenty of historic microfiche. Uh, someone went and dug it all out for me a few years ago. There's a lot of microfiche on this fight. But, um, and it becomes a big deal because in the end, you know, it's a long story. I'm going to make it fast forward. We win. They, I, we get dragged out. Um, we get taken to the county jail for the night. Then they want to charge us. This is called an overreach by the boss. It's the same thing I teach workers. When the boss overreaches, you got to go right at him, right? So the overreach is Don Blinken, father of the current Secretary of State. Don Blinken wants me removed from the board, um, says I have a conflict of interest, and wants me prosecuted. So they prosecute, and the chancellor says we're going to we're going to prosecute her. Big mistake. You know I'm. 18, young, blonde, athletic, you know, student leader trying to get our money out of South Africa with a bunch of racist people shooting down black people in South Africa. Some, someone was giving them very bad advice. So they decide to go after me um, and several other students who become known as the SUNY Six, State University of New York. We become known as the SUNY Six. Everyone else cuts a deal, pays a big fine, and in my case, they weren't letting me off the hook. In the case of five of my co-students, um, we decide we're in, it, we're in it to win it and we're gonna take a trial. So we're gonna force a trial on the state university. We force a trial on them. Everyone was trying to get the governor to like give her a pardon or whatever. Everyone kept trying to go to the governor and say, that, like at some point they realized this was a big mistake. So now we're putting the whole state on trial. And I get these volunteer lawyers from the National Lawyers Guild who fly right in and say, oh, we're gonna take this case. We're going to do discovery on the state university. And we start to have, I don't realize how fun dis the legal discovery process is. I don't know anything about it. So we're petitioning all these documents from the state of New York, the relationship between Mario Cuomo and the investment people. And are, are we double dipping? Are there conflicts of interest? Um, and we turn the, the trial of six students into like a massive media event every day in the state university. I mean, in the university headquarters, in the court headquarters in the state capitol in Albany, New York. Um, we're getting covered. Associated Press, National News every day, student leaders on trial. No other university was putting their students on trial. There were protests going on all over the United States, probably Canada, but this was the movement. It was the anti-apartheid movement. So nobody else was trying to jail, you know, college kids for doing occupations of buildings except our chancellor. Big mistake. So we're just like, we're going to keep going for it. We have all these volunteer lawyers. We, at, we the best day was we got the African National Congress's official UN ambassador, the ANC, you know, not an official ambassador, but like the pseudo ambassador, because um, the UN wouldn't recognize them, but a lot of the world would recognize them. We had the ambassador brought up to New York on a train to testify on our behalf about the conditions in South Africa. Uh, and the judge found us guilty, which was also a stupid move. So the judge says, um, I'm finding you guilty of like just under a felony, like a high misdemeanor. I forget the charge, but it was just shy of a felony for property damage or some ridiculousness. Um, and the judge says, you know, he's reading the decision in front of the courtroom and people are like the press. I mean, everyone at this point is like, what are they doing? So the judge says you're, you're guilty of whatever level of misdemeanor charges it was. And you either can do 30 days in jail or you can agree to sign, this is really interesting, or you can agree to sign a legal document that says that you will no longer engage in protest as long as you're a student. Well, that took about <laughs> negative 30 seconds for me to make the decision and the, and the lawyers from the National Lawyers Guild, right? Who were like, yeah, no deal. And they sent six of us off to jail. Well, three more actually pled out at that point because their parents were terrified and they were kind of terrified, to be honest. So three of us, wind up going to jail on a 30-day term. 
And I got like New York Times, AP, it was cuckoo crazy. We had a great communications director who was like 22 years old. Um, and we were all over the national media, like student leader jailed fighting a racist apartheid regime. Um, I came out, went back to the next, you know, I come out of jail. Now it's like, you know, the process like a year later, I come out of jail. I go to the next meeting of the board of trustees after I'm released from jail. The meeting is like three days later. So the timing is cuckoo great. I walk into the board of trustee meeting. I'm now like a nationally known student leader. I walk in. The board collapses. We win the we win the full divestiture, and it becomes the single largest divestment action at that point in the history of the anti-apartheid movement. And suddenly, I'm getting phone calls from you know like famous people in South Africa, right, congratulating us for the single largest divestment at that point in the movement in the United States. So those are all very early lessons about building structure in the dormitories. Um, building block captain structures uh, and realizing the strategic tactical warfare of the media and of the court system and using it against um, the power structure. And winning. Oh, sorry. We won. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, th okay. th there is no, in my mind, there was no option that we were not going to win and become <laughs> the first university to seriously pull you know, hundreds of millions of dollars out of investments in South Africa. Yeah, so we win. All right, well, you, you leave me with some hope here. Uh, okay, this is part one of a multi-part uh, interview. We're going to be keep this going on for a few weeks, but by the time you watch this, we'll roll them out once or twice a week. Uh, thanks very much for joining, joining me, Jane. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Please don't forget there's a donate button at the top of the webpage and share this and subscribe and all of that. And uh, we'll be back again soon.